Sorry, I know you guys are jealous now because I just said that. But it's like really cool to just like watch God's people worshiping. So such a beautiful thing. Um, by the way, if you want to join worship team, just come talk to me. Um, we got plenty. I know you don't see a lot of space on the stage, but trust me, there's always room. So one, two, ready, go.
just me and you Just a heart song singing out of tune I remember the simplicity Just to feel you here was
Such a blessing to see the children grow. So, Joanna, I just want to say great three songs. I like the first one. If you said it, I can believe it. Jesus said, and you all are very familiar with these verses, unless you enter the kingdom as a child, you will no wise enter it. Our love for Jesus is all he wants. He does not require anything else. That's all your children you want from your children to know that they love you and they care for you and then in Hebrews he says I am always with you I will never leave you I am your help you have nothing to fear I will not fear so Lord as we face a world that is in trouble as we face people who are at home in our congregation who are in rehab or hospitals or recovering at home Lord, we know that you are with them, and we want to remember them. I want you to take a second, just look around at your family, your brothers and sisters in this congregation. God has called us together to, to be able to help each other, to depend on each other, to love each other. We have such great blessing for him that know that God is with us. Let's go to word, the Lord with a word of prayer. Father, we just we praise your name, not for what you've done for us, but just for who you are. For you are the God who has created all the beauty in the world, Lord, and we seem to have messed it up. Lord, we know that you are with us, that you care for us, that you watch over us, and that you are with those that are not here, with our families, with our brothers and sisters. We lift up Matt to you, especially this morning, as he has a chance to get away and recover and um, re, -re, re refresh as he spends time with his new grandson at the same time facing um, hospice taking care of his dad who may only have days to live. So we pray especially for Matt this morning that you would comfort him. We pray for those that are at, at home watching on us TV that your hand would minister your grace to them. We thank you Lord that you are able to do all we ask beyond what we can think about or even consider Lord and you are the God in heaven. You have not only the ability, but you want to bless us. And so we thank you this morning. May our praise, may our worship of you magnify your name, bring glory to your name. And we ask this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As Jim said, uh, Matt and Jen are uh, getting some grandson time with their grandson Levi and, of course, with Logan and Hannah in Utah, so we pray with them that they will enjoy their break, even in spite of uh, Matt's dad's situation. You know, this week we've experienced a, a tragic unfolding of events in Israel and Palestine. So many lives lost, uh, families heart-rendingly torn apart. Once again, the vile, evil reality of brokenness in our existence is being exposed. Psalm 122.6 says, We are told to pray for Jerusalem, the peace of Jerusalem. And we know true peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, in Galatians 5.22. And we know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is truth that we place our confidence in. Let's pray and commit our time to the Lord and pray uh, that the Prince of Peace would establish peace around the world. Father, we follow your instruction to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for your sovereignty and what is transpiring there. Father, I pray that you would give leaders wisdom and insight that is needed to establish peace. Father, I pray that peace would overcome brokenness. Father, I pray for those families that are directly affected, that somehow you would get the glory and that they would come to know you as a result. We thank you for this service today, 
and we pray for your blessing on every aspect. I pray that my words would be only your words, and I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, the passage of Scripture I want to look at today is very familiar to many of us, but I want to look at it from a little bit of a different perspective. And let me start by saying that um, we human beings all around the world live in our cultures. And there are paradigms that define our cultures. Now, in short, a cultural paradigm is defined as the cultural role concepts we must use to negotiate our notion of self and our relationships with others in our everyday lives. Okay, so basically paradigms are rules that our society places on us and that are a part of our culture. For example, one of the paradigms is individualism versus community. Now, this paradigm is part of our American culture. We're very much on the individualistic side. Generally, we don't think much about how our actions or activities will affect our community but that's not the way it is around the world. This became obvious during the COVID pandemic. Uh, Individualistic individualistic perspectives were expressed about vaccinations. Uh, Oh boy, we could go into a whole list there, but we're not gonna get into that. Um, Okay, yeah, enough about that. Another paradigm in our American culture is guilt righteousness. See, the, uh, we here in America follow the Greek system of law. Here in North America and also in Europe, often called the Western world, we have a complex legal system based on guilt and innocence. A legal system that has direct effects on the church, actually. Many of our church fathers were trained in law. That's not me, yeah, good. So in Western culture, we tend to value truth, right from wrong, and individual rights. You're innocent until proven guilty. That's part of our culture. There are many other paradigms. For example, there's shame honor. In many parts of the world, including Africa, Middle East, and Asia, truth and being right are less important than guarding honor and avoiding shame. i never forget in China, I was in Beijing and I asked a young man for directions. He told me how to get there and I go down it totally wrong. He just would rather lie to me than admit he didn't know how to help me. So it's just part of the shame on our culture that I learned through my time there. Okay, now this, this communal, uh, uh, well, the shame honor can actually increase or decrease the prestige of a person in their culture, in their community. The late author Nabil Qureshi illustrates this example when he writes about a time in his youth when he would ask for a free cup of water, but then he would fill it with Pepsi and drink it. In his eyes, under his worldview, there was nothing wrong with doing that until someone noticed and called him out on it, and then he experienced shame, he says. From our Western perspective, the honor killings are barbaric, but uh, a Muslim friend took uh, a, a Muslim took a friend to see the movie The Passion of Christ, and after viewing the movie, this friend said, "I feel so unclean." That's the shame honor paradigm, and this brings up another cultural paradigm: clean and unclean. This is very common in India. This paradigm was especially true in the Hebrew culture and still exists today. In the Old Testament, one would be ceremonially uncle- one could be ceremonially unclean. And remember, if you had leprosy, you had to call out, unclean, unclean. Boy, you did that today, people would say, take a shower. <laughs> yeah, right? All right, another paradigm in our cultures around the world is power and no power. If you were to be born into in, at, India, then you would want to be born into the Brahmin sect or, or uh, um, caste. Yeah, because the Brahmin caste is the highest, they have all the power, and the other castes, the three others, have virtually no power. These paradigms shape our culture. And you, you may be wondering why I'm going into all of this, but, but the fascinating thing to me is that scripture addresses all of the paradigms we have 
in all the cultures around the world. As I said earlier, the passage I want to look at today is very familiar to us, uh, but I, I want to look at it from a different perspective, from a Middle Eastern perspective. As many of you know, I spend a lot of times with Arabs, and so I want to look at this passage in a unique way. In the Middle East, communication is much more important than the individual. Shame, honor permeates their culture. So let's dig into Luke's account of Jesus' telling of the parable that we call the prodigal son. But first, let me set the stage. Let's go back a little bit to Luke 14. Jesus is invited on our one Sabbath to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees where they were watching him very closely. And there was a man there who was suffering from dropsy or endema, which is a swelling of the tissues of the flesh, and it usually occurs in the legs and feet. Now, is this a setup of the Pharisees to see if Jesus would heal on the Sabbath? Most likely, but Jesus, being Jesus, actually uh, stumped them when he asked, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They didn't have an answer. And then he followed that question with another question they couldn't reply to and said, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? Yeah, they couldn't give an answer. So then Jesus tells the parable about sitting at a place of honor and then being asked to move, and you, quote, will begin with shame to take the lowest place, end quote. And he ends that parable with, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus goes into the parable of the great banquet, where those who cannot repay or reciprocate are the ones that should be invited because they can't reciprocate. And you will get your, he says, quote, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. In other words, you'll get your rewards in heaven. And then he continues on about the banquet where the, the host invites all these people and they give all these lame excuses, like I just bought a piece of land and I have to go see it. Wait, who buys a piece of land without even seeing it? Yeah. So anyway, he says, uh, the master says, go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in for, to my house so that my house will be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who are invited shall taste my banquet. See, this parable at a banquet about another banquet <laughs> reinforced Jesus' previous teaching that he would abandon Jerusalem in Luke 13, 34 to 35. The people who originally had been offered a share of the kingdom had rejected it. And now the message was that he was going to give it to others like the Gentiles. In Luke 15, the setting has changed. John Martin, in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, writes, Jesus combated the religious leaders by teaching again that some who were considered to be hopeless and sinners would be in the kingdom. Here are perhaps the best known of Jesus' parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son, or the lost son. All three parables teach the same message, that God is vitally concerned with the repentance of sinners. But the third story goes beyond the others, applying that truth to the situation in which Jesus found himself, being accepted by the outcasts of society while being rejected by the religious leaders. Okay, we get into the, the lost sheep, uh, 15, 3 through 7. The parable of the lost sheep teaches that there is rejoicing in heaven when a sinner repents, in contrast with the Pharisees who thought themselves righteous and therefore in no need to repent. Then the lost coin. This teaches that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels when a sinner repents. And the same message that's the same message as the lost sheep, the parable of the lost sheep. But the search is emphasized. 
The, the point would have been clear to Jesus' listeners. The sinners with whom he was associating were extremely valuable to God. And finally, we get to our passage today, Luke 15, 11 to 32, the parable of the prodigal son, which is actually misnamed. It should be called the parable of the loving father. <laughs> All right, let's go through it. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine rose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pots that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son... For, my, for this my son was dead and, uh, and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this young son of yours came, he who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him, and he said to him, Son... You have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. All right, let's go back to the beginning and analyze this. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. Now, when a Middle Easterner reads this passage the first thing that pops into their mind is, where's the older brother? The older brother should have been stopping his younger brother from going to his father and demanding his inheritance. Saban Rashid, an Arab, writes, generally speaking, just as most cultures in the East, families regard the eldest son as a second father. They treat him with respect and they support him to play a role, a vital role, in the ongoing of the family life. He's supposed to be there for the younger siblings with physical, emotional, and social support. If the father passes away or gets too ill to tackle his responsibilities, the eldest son usually steps up to it and takes care of the family. There's the Arab perspective of the oldest son. From their cultural perspective, the elder son is delinquent, AWL. He's totally disregarding his responsibility to keep his sibling brother in line. Father, give me the share of my property that's coming to me. Now, first of all, this younger son is basically saying, I wish you were dead and I had your money. Okay? Kenneth Bailey in his book, The Forgotten Faithful, A Window into the Life and Witness of Christians in the Holy Land, writes... 
This request is an outrageous violation of traditional culture, implying the son's eagerness for his father's death. Such an insulting request should be met with rage, a smack on the head, and expulsion from the house. But instead, the father breaks the code of the oriental patriarch and humbly grants his son's request. So we keep reading, and he divided his property between them, and not many days later the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. Reckless living. We've often heard this translated decadent or immoral living. Other translations say riotous, that's the King James, or loose, the Revised Standard Version, or wild, the New International Version translates that. However, the Greek word asotos does not necessarily mean any of these things. Asotos means expensive or literally without saving. The Arabic versions of this text translate the phrase expensive living. So the son wasted his inheritance on expensive living. The text does not say anything about the prodigal a son actually sleeping with prostitutes or even behaving immorally, as his older brother later states. But this doesn't let the prodigal son off the hook. I mean, he did squander his family's inheritance. Okay, we continue reading. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And as he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, or he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Okay, this son had obviously gone to a Gentile country because they were raising and eating pigs. This would not happen in Israel. Um, I heard a sermon a few years ago from a music pastor, worship pastor, Joanna, and uh, it was one of our supporting churches, and he was preaching, and he, he entitled his sermon, Simeon's Bucket List. And of course, number one on Simeon's bucket list was to see the Messiah. He went through a couple other points. And then the last point, the last point on his bucket list was, and Lord, I just want to try one piece of bacon. It smells so good. <laughs> I had a Muslim friend ask me, Paul, do you eat pig? And I said, well, we call it pork. <laughs> And I said, yes. And uh, he says, well, does it taste good? And I had to answer, it's kind of hard to beat the taste of bacon. Yeah. All right. So, um, so the young son, when he came to himself, said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants. Now, Bailey, in his book, writes, if a Jewish boy in first century Palestine wastes his family inheritance among Gentiles and then dares to return home, the village performs what is called a kazaza ceremony. In this ceremony, the village breaks a large pot in front of the boy, symbolically portraying and officially proclaiming the separation between the boy and the village. Bailey continues, fearing this ceremony that awaits him back home, the prodigal son looks for a job that may help him earn back all the money he squandered. The only job he can find, however, is feeding pigs. And since the job fails to support him, he eventually becomes so famished that he wants to eat the pig's carob pods. Carob pods are far too coarse for humans to digest. So before wishing to become a pig himself in order to stomach the pods, the prodigal son finally decides to return home and face the humiliation of the kazaza ceremony. He prepares a speech in which he begs his father to hire him as a servant, knowing that the father-son relationship at this point has been completely annulled. So the son arose came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. See, the father was home. 
you, you can't be lost unless you have a home. So the son is returning home to face the humiliation. And the father ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now remember, as is the case today in the Arab world, wearing a robe is everyday dress. Bailey continues in his book, The father in the Middle Eastern culture is expected to sit in the house emotionally withdrawn and wait to hear what the son has to say for himself. Now the mother, on the other hand, can greet the poor boy with kisses before the kazaza ceremony. Although running is an act done mostly by servants, the mother is allowed to run a little bit to greet her returning son. However, a patriarch never runs. Doing so would be highly undignified and even contemptible. But as Jesus tells this story, okay, that was the end of uh, Bailey and his writing, but as Jesus tells this story, the father breaks all the rules and looks extremely undignified as he runs toward his son and plays the role of the mother as he showers him with kisses. There will be no kazaza ceremony. Okay, now, how do you run in a robe? I don't know if you guys have to run to the bathroom in your bathroom in the morning, you might experience this. I wore a Saudi robe a couple of Sundays ago for the mission Sunday. And just walking up to the podium, to the microphone, I was like, I'm going to fall. I mean, it wraps around your legs. It's, it's, it's. One of the Saudi guys told me, no, when you get a robe, you go on and get measured for your stride. And so they make it big enough to fit your stride. Mine was obviously not measured for me. Okay, uh, although this, this artist's rendition doesn't show it, the only way that you can run in a robe is to actually reach down and hike up the robe so that your legs are free to run. But that is a very shameful act in the Arab culture. Exposing your legs, legs is not acceptable as, as a man. This is part of the shame honor concept in their culture, or aspect in their culture. The father was willing to take shame on himself for his son, to run out and meet him. I love these images of the father embracing and kissing his son. I love this one, the emasculated character of the son being embraced by his father. In one of my Islamic studies classes at Denver Seminary, my Lebanese professor asked us, well, why did the father run out to meet the son? Why was he looking for him and ran out to meet him? We all answered, of course, he loved him, he missed him. And our prof said, no, you're overlooking the um, community and shame aspect of the Arab culture. You see, the son had not only brought shame on himself, shame on his family, but he had also brought shame on his community. And when you bring shame on the community, there are consequences. If the other eldest sons had seen the returning son first, they would have gone out and punished him, or the fathers even. They would have punished this young man and maybe even killed him because he brought shame on their community. The father ran out to meet his returning son to protect him and to safely bring him back to the house. Aspect we in our North American culture would never think of, but is very real in the Arab cultures. So the son said to his father as he had practiced, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now here we have the common thread of the three most powerful parables Jesus told. And that is that God loves when a sinner repents. Say that with me. God loves when a sinner repents. That is the as the Germans say, the red thread that goes through all three parables. Now the father responds, 
and said to the student, uh, servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. When our kids were young in Germany, there was a cassette tape <laughs> that uh, Pat Boone had made about the prodigal son, and it was called Ants Hylvania. And it was, the characters were all ants. And so Antony was the main character. Samantha was another character. And, and uh, so when the prodigal son returns, the father says, kill the fatted aphid. My son has returned. <laughs> My kids love that tape. All right, so uh, they begin to celebrate. And Bailey writes, this celebration however, is not in honor of the prodigal son. Certainly no one in the village would attend a party held in honor of such a disrespectful son. The celebration, disrespectful son. The celebration honors the father and the father's self-sacrifice, willing to take shame on himself, and generosity in restoring his son to the family. The father sacrificed his social dignity and broke the patriarchal code in order to save his son. It is the saving and sacrificial love of the father that the banquet celebrates. Now, my Saudi friends tell me that when they celebrate, it is a big deal. They say the immediate family, the servants, the extended family and friends are all invited. There's so much food and the guests control the evening. They are the center of the uh, attention. When the guest finishes eating and stands up, the meal's over. (laughs) Everybody stops. The guests kind of rule the evening, very different than our culture. Now, a little over a week ago, I was invited to a luncheon. And uh, it turned out to be the meal after going to the mosque. And I was there with 14 Libyan men. And I got concerned about my safety a little bit. Uh, But as is their tradition, we sat on the floor, and there was uh, two groups and a single dish of food in the middle of each group, and uh, we ate with a spoon, and of course the meat you ate with your hands. And the imam from their mosque was there with his son, and sitting in, I was invited into his group. Uh, We had couscous with vegetables in it, and uh, lamb, Uh, it was good. Afterwards, uh, they brought uh, all kinds of fruit, and uh, you know, we started at 2.30, and I left at 4 o'clock. So it was quite a celebration, and it was, I was honored to be with these guys and to be just loved on. Uh, it was very special. All right, so now they're celebrating. The older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. His father came out. This means the father left his guests. Again, the father was willing to take shame on himself because that's a shameful thing to do. You never leave your guests. He was willing to take shame on himself, this time to go out to the older son. Guests, like I said, rule the evening in Saudi Arabia. And like I said, when they were finished, everyone is finished. The father, again was willing to take shame on himself. And the son says, But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. See, the older brother levied accusations at his younger brother that weren't true and claimed his own unrighteousness. 
And here we see a picture of the Pharisees. The older son was basing his relationship with his father on his works. Exactly what the Pharisees were doing in chapter 14. You know, it's interesting. We're not told whether the other brother ever came into the banquet. We don't know. The question remains, will we go into the banquet? In the parable of the lost son, the loving father is a picture of God. Jesus' willingness to die on the cross for you and for me. Willing to endure that shame of the cross. We are the prodigal son. We're the sinners. And the older brother is a picture of the Pharisees believing they were righteous because of their works and in no need to repent. These three parables the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, the prodigal son, tell how much God loves us, how valuable we are to him. They tell us how much God is seeking us, just like the widow looking for that coin. He is seeking us. All three tell how much God loves. Let's say it together repentance. God loves repentance. God's love draws us to repentance. God's grace precedes our repentance. God knows us. He knows our feelings of unworthiness, and he tells us we are each valuable. He knows we're broken. He knows we're going to stumble into sin 1 Samuel 16, 9 says, God looks at the heart. He sees our true motivation when we repent. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He wipes the slate clean. Even of those things that are in our lives that he hasn't brought to light, he wipes the slate clean. God loves, let's hear it again, Repentance. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And when the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, Acts 16, 31. Now the question I want to end with today is, have you gone into the banquet? Have you responded to God seeking you, wanting to put a robe of honor on you, a ring on your hand or your finger, uh, uh, shoes on your feet, and adopt you into his family? If you have a question about this or you want to take the step to believe in Jesus, I would love to talk with you. Come see me after the service. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us so much and that you seek, are seeking us, that you have offered a plan to redeem us from our sin. Father, thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, willing to accept that shame for each one of us. Father, I pray that this insight into the Middle Eastern culture would help us to apply this parable in our lives and cause us to walk closer with you or to come into a relationship with you as a result. Father, again, I thank you for this service. I thank you for the rest of our Sunday, and I ask your blessing on it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, just in a real announcement, um, we do have our quarterly meeting afterwards, so don't take off and leave. Um, let me close this time with the benediction from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.